I am very pleased to invite my friend, Reverend Dr. Norma Edwards, who is a near-death experiencer who's lived a purpose-driven life of service. She's the founder and director of Reprogram Your Life and a certified NLP life coach. Dr. Edwards is also a recognized expert at merging spiritual practices into clinical practice. She was the first person ever to, gra to be granted a contract from the federal government to merge spiritual practices into clinical practice in federal prisons, working with drug addicts and focusing on rehabilitation and community reentry. Her integrative process, Reprogram Your Life, has transformed the lives of men and women in prisons and at CSOSA's reentry center in Washington, D.C. In 1999, under her maiden name of Jennings, Norma was awarded the Linoz Leadership Award for the Community Foundation for the National Capital Region in Washington, D.C. for her work in prisons and community development. Norma also spent many years working with young women conducting rites of passage at James Madison's University while increasing diversity on campus. She is also the, also the author, author of the book, Awakening, which is an amazing book that I encourage you to get on Amazon. And you can also get it on her website. And Dr. Edwards has presented at National Institute of Health. She's been featured on the Shift Network, Voice America, Spirituality 101, provided uh, workshops at IONS National Conferences, the Edgar Casey Foundation, and Awaken Center for Human Evolution, and has left spiritual footprints in Jamaica, England, South America, and Japan. I'm truly honored to welcome you, Norma. So take it away. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful introduction. And I want to say how excited I am to be here this evening and to share, to share my 56 years of experience of being a near-death experiencer. Welcome everyone. And I hope that each and every one of you will leave uh, tonight with a little bit more insight on what it means to be a near-death experiencer and how it is that we um, impact our families, our friends, and in the community as we go along. First of all, I noticed, um, Sean, that your highlight on the, on the notice you sent out was that I was sent back with a message. And I'm sure everybody here wants to know what that message was. And the message was very simple. There is more to life than meets the eye. Life is eternal. And I was told to come back into my body and spread that message. And then once I learned how to travel independently without a medical emergency, and then they expanded on that message. And what I was given then is God is love, and love is eternal. And that it is love that is uh, the creator of light. And that light is the steward of creation and recreation. And so therefore I was given this when I traveled to the ninth dimension. And then I was given a download on how to understand that very well and to be able to interpret it to others. So I'm happy to give you the message here this evening. So we start off with the message. In 1966, I was 26 years of age living in London, England. When I woke up one morning, not feeling very well because I had been away from work on and off uh, for about a month. And my doctors didn't seem to be able to know what was wrong with me. I got to work that day and during the course of the day, the pain increased until I got to about four o'clock and it occurred to me that they were following the patterns of labor pains. I stepped into an elevator to leave work early. And in that elevator was a 
Hindu woman, beautiful Hindu woman, young woman. And I knew she was Hindu because she was wearing her Indian outfit with the sari and the, the dot on her head. And um, I collapsed in the elevator. So the elevator door opened and she really very quickly um, got things together and uh, the hospital was not very far, two blocks away from where, where I worked. So instead of getting an ambulance, she hailed a cab and they got me into the cab and got me to the hospital. When I got there, I kind of gained consciousness briefly and um, the emergency began. Now the cab driver who was gracious enough to, to help her to get me into the, the emergency room, he drove away with my handbag. Not knowing that he had done that, he did return the bag on the next day. But there I was unconscious, and there she was, and um, she knew nothing about me. We were just two strangers in an elevator, two people from different cultures. But she stayed the entire night. And at one point when they were wheeling me into, into surgery, I opened my eyes, and the doctor explained to me that I had a three month baby who died inside of me and was poisoning my system and they had to do surgery. That's the last thing I remembered hearing, excruciating pain. And then the next thing I know, I've kind of like risen out of my, oh, before I rise out of my body, I'm in the emergency room, in the, in the operating room, I'm lying on the operating table and um, I find myself on the ceiling. And I'm on the ceiling and I'm looking down at this, this space. You know, there's nurses running back and forth and there are two doctors there. And, 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 and I'm confused because you see, now I am at perfect peace. The pain is gone. There is no pain. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this emergency situation. You know, people are moving with this, with this whole notion of emergency. And so I want to get down to the, to the floor to let the doctors know that they don't need to perform the operation anymore. The pain is gone, you see. And as soon as I have the thought, how does one get around under these conditions? I find myself on the floor. I'm on the floor. And I'm running from doctor to doctor, screaming at them, there's no need for you to do the operation because I'm fine. I'm feeling fine. I don't understand why, but didn't seem to be able to recognize my presence at all. So in this state, it seems that I'm processing really well because I'm thinking now, well, if the men can't recognize my presence, then maybe women being more intuitive they may be able to recognize me. So now I'm running from nurse to nurse and I'm kind of waving my hands and like, this is me, I'm, I'm okay. And then it's very strange. Nobody seems to be able to know that I'm, I'm out of my body and I'm in the room. And then the next thing I know is a flat line. And I look at the flat line, I know what it means because I've had friends who were nurses and. And I'm like, this is crazy. That graph says I'm dead, but I can't be dead because I'm processing and I'm very much here. I don't really know what's going on. But then the next thing is the doctor picks up the paddles <laughs> to shock me back into life. And I look, I can see a corona of electricity around it. And the thought in my head is, I'm not dead, but if I stay here, these people might kill me accidentally. And with that thought, I went straight through the ceiling and I'm moving very, very swiftly, almost at the speed of light. And I, I entered a very dark tunnel. What was very interesting about the tunnel, even though it was very dark, I was not afraid. I was a perfect piece. And I'm moving through the tunnel and then we come across, come around a bend. And when I come around the bend, I could see the end of the tunnel. And the first thing that hits me, it's like this kaleidoscope of colors, 
colors that are a whole lot more than the ones we experience or we see here. And as I approach the mouth of the tunnel, the color, the kaleidoscope of color changes to absolutely pure, brilliant white light. And the thought in my head was, with the speed at which I was moving, I felt that when I hit that barrier of light, it would in fact burn the corona out of my eyes. And then I merged. And guys, there are no words in any language to experience the joy, the beauty, the thrill, the glory of merging with light. In merging with light, I realized I had become love. And it was the most electrifying, beautiful experience. That to this day, it's been 56 years, and I can still close my eyes and experience it. So here I am now, feeling very elated. And um, I'm wondering now, I'm looking around, and I'm wondering, um, how does one get around? in this environment. And again, with the speed of thought, and we need to really recognize even in our human bodies, that our thoughts will take us exactly where that field of energy is directed. I began to move. And as I moved, I moved to what looked like a, um, you know, the Greeks built those huge um, buildings for um, where they had, um, well, I, I guess, ton, hundreds and hundreds of people gathered. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Coliseums. That's right. So I moved to this Coliseum. And when I get to the Coliseum, I stop. When I stop, the biggest television screen I'd ever seen in my life, because in those days, in the 1960s, Television screens were tiny. This was a humongous television set, and it lit up. And when it lit up, it began to scroll very slowly. And then I can see words being implanted on it. And it was a humongous screen divided in three. The left-hand side was my life as I had planned it. The middle column was my life as I had lived it in pictures. And the third column was quite hilarious. I couldn't stop laughing. Because when I look to the left, I can see what it is I planned. When I look in the middle, I had not lived anything that I had planned. And I'm thinking, how could I have been so stupid? How could I have been living such an illusion that I forgot what my life plan was. And on the far side of the screen, <laughs> it looked as though someone had created a stamp. And the stamp said, objective not accomplished. And then I would go back to the, to the left-hand side of the screen and I would look at the next, because I'm looking at my life in phases, like birth to three, three to 12, 12, and so on. I was 26 years at the time. But in the, in the third column, again, the stamp, objective not accomplished, objective not accomplished. And so now I'm kind of like laughing, but then I'm thinking, how could I have been so stupid not to have known that I had a plan? And, and why didn't I somehow try to consult this plan? Because I'm really feeling quite silly. It was not a judgmental thing but rather a, how could I not have known, see, that there was a plan. And so the screen came to an end. And when I was a child, I grew up in the Christian community. And when I was a child, I had lots of questions. Every Sunday after we came out of church, I would have these questions from my mother, from my grandmother, and for anybody who would listen but they could not answer them. And the biggest question I had was, this is when my mother actually put me to sit down and said, would you please not even look at pastor on a Sunday morning? Never mind, talk to him. Don't ask him any questions because 
you're asking him questions he cannot answer. And the big question for me was, and Christ came and he said, I came so you can have life and have it more abundantly. I said, but Christ died and everybody else has been dying since then. What did he mean by that? Or was it that he was just plain lying? Well, you know, my mother kind of like put me in detention for that one. So after a while, I stopped asking questions and I started writing them down without realizing that um, I was writing a journal. And so that question that burned into my head at nine years of age appeared into my mind as I stood at the record. And as soon as it did, the screen cleared. And what came up at first was a phenomenal pattern. And I'm staring at this pattern as I'm staring in the pattern, in, in, in portions of the pattern, I can now see lives that I have lived. And I am now at the Akashic record. And reviewing the Akashic record now, it was very clear that those words were quite true, but unfortunately, the intelligence at the time that gave the interpretation for those words was not advanced enough to understand them. And so I'm looking now at, at seven lifetimes. I'm looking at the lifetime I have just left and some of the trials and tribulations that I have had. And I'm looking at six other lifetimes that, gets, that got dropped in the middle of the lifetime I had just left so that I can see the correlation between what I had experienced in that lifetime and where it is that it fitted in in the lifetime that I had just left. I saw myself in the dark, dark ages when it seems like there was no light on the earth and uh, people walked around with the torches. And at that time, there was a tribal war going on. And the, the community that I lived in was at the, they were not winning the war. They were losing the war and um, a lot of people were dying all around us. And so they, they mustered up all the boats that they can and they put the women and as many women and as many children as they could into these boats with the hope that somehow if they push us out to sea, we would survive long enough to be able to repopulate. But the boat, in, the boat that I was in, there were 24 women. The boat sank and we all drowned. And I could feel, literally fear the fear of what happened in that boat as it went under and one, each, each, each and every one of us drowned. So that was a tremendous amount of fear. They were pointing to showing me that there was a tremendous amount of fear locked within my super consciousness that needed to be released. One of the other very um, intriguing ones that I saw was um, I saw myself as a, as a warrior, as a warrior, and um, it wasn't the, the gun, but rather the, the knives, the knives that were important in that that that, that um, lifetime. And I watched myself as a male and as a, as a, um, a fighter. I was very much in, involved in war. Then I moved to um, the moment when Moses was retrieved from the basket in the water in the riverside. And I was among the women who were bathing, washing our hair and, and, and washing clothes. And this little basket came up and I, I was the one who um, encouraged them since our leader's wife didn't seem to be able to have a baby and it it really bothered bothered her that the best thing for us to do would be to present her with this baby and see whether she would accept it. And it was Moses in the basket in the bulrushes. And then there was a lifetime that I saw myself at the foot of the cross screaming crucify him 
and and feeling all that that energy that 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 negative energy that was being proclaimed and being very conscious while i was observing that that we were judging something we couldn't understand we didn't have the understanding we didn't have the intellect to understand it then i found myself um in the cotton fields with my mother slave mother was a slave and I was a slave child and we were in the cotton fields and we were picking cotton and then I could hear the resounding noise of the hooves of the the horse that the massa man was riding and I knew that he was going to do the rose and I could hear the sound of his whip when it hit the back of a slave that could not meet their quota and the fear that I felt, knowing that as a child, when he got to me, I would feel the whip on my back. Because as a child, I too could not meet that quota. And then it flipped to the next lifetime. And next lifetime, I'm the white mass of man on a horse, flipping the whip on the backs of slaves. That one shook me up. Because when we talk about oneness, we don't understand that we live many lifetimes and we live every single sequence, male, female, poor, with power, without power. And so I reviewed these seven lifetimes. In each lifetime, I was made to experience the pain or the joy whichever emotion it was that was very relevant in that experience, I was made to feel it and experience it. So the review comes to an end and I am wondering, well, why didn't somebody tell me that we live several lifetimes? Because you see, that was the answer to my question. What did he mean when he said that? And what he meant was your, your, your soul never dies. This body, it's like, think of an astronaut who must go out into space and he must put on that space suit. And he knows that when he enters an atmosphere other than earth, he cannot remove his suit. Well, it's the same with us. We come to earth, we have a body, it's a suit really. And we know that while we're here on earth, you cannot remove it. But when it's time when we have learned or perhaps refuse to learn what we were sent to learn, then it's time to go home. Earth is not our home. It's time to go home. And when we go home, we discard the suit, leave it behind, and we can become who we are, beings of light, stewards of creation. So the review came to an end, and I'm now heavy with the thoughts from the experiences and the emotions that I had just experienced. And um, again, I asked the question, well, how, how does one get around in this environment? And again, as soon as I asked the question, I am moving again. And now I am brought to a river. When I was a child, we used to sing the little chorus. Yes, we will gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows from the throne of God. And I'm taken to the river. And on the other side of the river, there are hundreds of souls. All of them beaming love to me and beaming light to me. Now, some of those souls I could recognize because they were souls that departed in my lifetime. Many of them, most of them, I could not recognize, but I could feel the love that they radiated to me. And that each one of them had a particular experience and a particular set of loving emotions that they were reminding me of. And so my aunt, my, my, my parents were alive at that time. My aunt, who I grew up between my aunt and my mother, my aunt never had children, so I, I always felt like I had two mothers. I grew up with two mothers. And 
And while I knew that she loved me, I had no idea that she loved me as much as she did. And she stepped into the water and she began to walk towards me with hands, with hands outstretched. And I began to walk towards her, excitedly expecting that we will meet in the center and we would embrace. And just as we got to that point, she stopped and she looked at me and she said, I'm so sorry, they're sending you back. Cannot embrace you, they're sending you back. And I said, why? And she said, well, they're sending you with a message. And I said, well, there are millions of people back there. Surely they can find somebody back there to give that message to. I don't want to go back. And she says, well, I'm sorry. They are sending you back. And when you get there, you have this message that you must give to humanity. And no sooner than she said that, I found myself falling this time. It's kind of interesting. I got there by way of a dark tunnel into the light. But leaving the light, I was just falling, 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 falling until I slammed into my body. And that was the most unhealthy, undesirable thing that I think I have ever experienced in my entire life. Slammed into the body. And even though I was under anesthesia for the moment there, I felt the excruciating pain, the total discomfort. When you enter the body in that way, the body has a very, very not so nice smell. Um, and, and I was just depressed because I did not want to return. I, I could not see the value of returning. Uh, the next thing I know is I, I must have fallen asleep. But when I woke up, I'm in, in ICU, the equivalent, I think, of ICU. And I'm on a bed and there are two nurses who are observing me and they are sitting at a small table and they're working with their hands, whatever it is they're doing from where I'm lying, you can see the hands going. And um, it seemed to me, well, it seems like they both attended the same church. And my near-death experience happened on a, on a Monday. And the one nurse, was off and she went to church and the other one had to work. So the nurse that went to church is um, explaining the sermon that the pastor gave on Sunday. And the sermon had a lot to do with hell. And I'm lying in this bed and I'm going, there is no hell. What is she talking about? How could a pastor sit with a congregation because you see, I am still now full of this understanding of what it means uh, to be loved unconditionally and a reminder that God is love. So I I'm outraged at the fact that, that, you know, she's narrating this and that this came out of the mouth of a pastor. And then it suddenly dawned on me, but Norma, hours ago, you believed that. What happened that caused the change, See, caused the phenomenon change? What in fact happened was when we have a near-death experience, we go through a paradigm shift. It's a shift that takes us from where our consciousness is into a different, a far different level of consciousness. And since for me, I had been to the Akashic Record, where the truth about not only humans, but humanity, the truth about the ages and the truth, the actual truth of what life is all about. Since I had been exposed to that, there is no way I could have accepted what this one young woman was saying to the other. And now I'm confused. Well, who am I? Hours ago, I had a certain belief system. The other thing that's fascinating me I'm lying there. I want to speak, but I can't because I've got, you know, you got tubes in your throat. I'm looking at these two young ladies and one of them was really quite ill and she didn't know it. But now I can see in the human body. And I'm thinking, wow, she is sitting here monitoring me, but she doesn't recognize that she needs surgery herself because now I can see into the human body. So when the, 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 um, the one nurse had finished 
explaining to the other about, they turned on a little radio there. And the radio was tuned to a classical station. And now my eyes are wide open because I can hear the rhythmic patterns, but I can see the notes. Every note is aligned to a color. Every color is aligned to a mathematical symbol. Every mathematical symbol is aligned to a number. And my eyes are like popping out of my head and I can see the way in which these two young ladies sitting there are absorbing. They're absorbing the, the energy and the light that's coming out of the music. And then a couple of male medical um, people came along, stopped to the table, and now I'm fascinated that they're male and they, they too are absorbing this energy that's coming out of music, you see. Absolutely fascinating. I'm like, what happened to me? What has happened to me? Because now I have a whole extended set of, um, of light. I have a whole extended set. I can see the aura around the human body. I can see the chakras. So you can imagine I was very, 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 very baffled. I stayed in the hospital for six days for recovery. And during that time, um, I could literally see, you know, inside of the, the other patients and what was wrong. And, and every now and again, I might hint, by the time I could speak, I might hint that, you know, you all are going the wrong way about this healing. And of course, they look at me as though I'm really strange. Well, what do you know? Well, what could you possibly tell a surgeon or a doctor or so or what have you? So for those six days, here I was with this question, well, who am I? Where did all this new information and all this new knowledge and the surety, the surety and self-assurance that I had about it? I remember there was, an, an because in those days, you know, you were in a hospital ward and there may be 10 beds and there was a, an elderly woman there and she was so afraid of dying. And I kept saying to her, no, you know, you're not going to die. You have another 10 years to live. And she's looking at me like, you know, who are you and, and what are you talking about? Um, when I left the hospital, the day I left the hospital, we stepped out of the door. And I now can see nature in a whole different light. I can see the light around the trees. I could see the energy in the trunk of the trees all the way down into the soil and the light that emanated from the roots. It, it was quite, 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 quite something to adjust to. Unfortunately, um, my, that was my first husband. He, he couldn't handle it. And every now and again, he would say, I think you need to see a psychologist. He started off first by saying, I need to see a psychologist. And then he turned it into, you really need to see a psychiatrist. And that's when I really started praying because I understood the difference between the two. Psychologi psychologists will write you a, a prescription. The psychiatrist will take his pen and commit you to a mental ward. So I shut up for 15 years. Would not speak about it for 15 years, but turned it over in my mind and had all these questions. And now one journal turned into four because I have even more questions now and nobody to ask for answers to these questions. What I did find is that I began to reread the Bible only now with a whole different um, level of interpretation and intelligence. Um, it was quite very difficult to adjust to life with heightened senses. Um, if I got close to computers or electrical patterns, like for example, if I was walking down the street at night and, and the street lights were on, as I got under the light, the, the, the bulb would blow. <laughs> I, it, it was quite an adjustment to adjust to life, seeing, seeing life through, through eyes that to me had been shifted and therefore had given me a totally different perspective on life.
and living. Now, once I, I went through three years of depression, serious depression, um, because you can't relate. You can't relate to people. People are talking to you and you can see that they're not very genuine. Um, you can feel those people who carry love and light. You can feel the people who carry darkness. It, it, was, it was horrendous. And so I became very um, suicidal. I attempted suicide twice and it didn't work. And the third time I really did my research and I was all ready with the right set of pills and a glass of water in my hand. And, and at this time I, I had and I saw my first son and I remembered, um, you clean the house, you know, as women, you clean the house, you're gonna kill yourself, you can clean the house, right? <laughs> and I um, put clean clothes on my son, et cetera, et cetera. And I sent him out in the garden to play. And I'm standing in the bathroom with one set of pills in my hand. I, I had done my research. I had asked nurses exactly what pills, you know, do people take and how much do they need to take? I thought I had it right that time. And I'm standing there saying the prayer before I swallow the pills. And my son comes running into the bathroom. He says, mommy, 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 look what I found. And when he opened his hand, it was half a caterpillar, half a butterfly. And I looked at it and I looked at the amazement in his eyes and the voice in my head said, and so when you're gone, who will teach him about the mysteries of life? And I turned my hand down, flushed the pills down, grabbed my son and went to the playground. And there I made the decision that if a medical emergency took me to the other side, then I am going to do, I made a commitment, whatever it took so that I can go back to the other side in a conscious state. It took eight spiritual teachers, three continents, two marriages, five children, or I should say seven children, because the one that was inside of me was very much a child, but it died. And I had my second child, uh, was born, lived for three hours, and he died. And um, it took a lot of work um, to finally be able to do that. And... Um, I came, I was born in Guyana, South America. I left Guyana uh, when I got married, my first husband, we got married at 19 and we went to England. Had our first child and we went to England. And there we got the education. And then after we got educated, of course, it was considered that you return back to your homeland and give back and we went back. I spent 12 years in England, 10 years in Guyana. And when it was time for the children to be educated, we came to America. During that time, my entire life changed. My entire life shifted in directions that I never expected it to go. And there were times when I was, felt like I was right up against the door of adversity. I just celebrated my 80th birthday and I have to tell you that when I look back on the journey, I can see that the blessings were not the money and the riches that we got. The blessings were the levels of adversity that I had to endure, which took me from just believing to knowing the truth. I want to stop there because I've been talking for a long while and ask if there are any questions. Now, you want to quiet? Well, well, everybody's muted while you're talking. And then what we will have them do is put the questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Did you tell the story about the bus, though? About the? The bus. Oh, you mean you keep saying the bus? It was a truck. That was a ten-ton. A truck. truck. I don't know. I for some reason I the keep seeing a big no, bus. The ten-ton <laughs> truck. Uh, the second attempt at um, committing suicide. 
I used to get up in the morning and go walking, you see. And I noticed that there was this big, huge truck which was parked in a certain place. Obviously, he, he, the driver must have lived in the area. And believe it or not, I actually uh, measured out how much time it would take for him to pick up the right amount of speed so when he hit me, it would be the end. And I planned it all out and had it all figured out. And um, it was a Monday morning. And I um, walked to the spot where I expected him to be because, you see, I've been watching and observing him for days. And I got to the spot where I knew that, you know, he would have picked up enough speed. And I stepped off of that sidewalk. And believe me, God takes care of fools and babies. <laughs> because to this day, I cannot understand how he stopped within an inch of my feet. And I've got my hands, I mean, I am I'm, I'm waving my fists to this man and I'm screaming and yelling at him. Of course, a lot of people came along and they think I am yelling at him because he nearly killed me. But I'm yelling at him because he failed to do what I expected him to do. And then, of course, I got depressed that I couldn't kill myself. <laughs> Thank you. That's, you know, most in the years here thing. understand that depression that happens afterwards. And I just mm -hmm. love your story only because, depression. you know, the year, you're here for a reason. You don't, you're not going back anytime soon. So, oh, please. I just started eating. What are you I doing? know. You got a lot of work to do. So oh, could you share? I want to know how, I doubt you knew it was the Akashic Records when you were going there the first time, right? That's right. I did not. What I never did you think? What was that like where you went? And, and at what point did you realize what it was? was and then also explain to people what the Akashic Records are in case some people okay. don't know. When I came back, you see, after I came back and um, they had to get me out of the suicidal state. <laughs> and once they got me out of the suicidal state, then um, I began to get downloads. And I was told that I had to be in bed at eight o'clock at night and that I would sleep from eight to 11. And that if I did not get myself in bed at eight o'clock, wherever I was, I'd fall asleep. And they weren't kidding because I happened to be on a bus one night at eight o'clock and I fell asleep on the bus. And when I opened my eyes, the bus had been vacated. Everybody had vacated the bus. The ambulance was there because they could not wake me up, you see. <laughs> they thought I was in a coma or something. They could not wake me up. And the ambulance, the people were just about lifting the gurney to put me on the gurney. You see what I'm saying? And I opened my eyes and I said, okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. Nobody believed me, of course. They still took me to the hospital and put me through, you know, stages. But during that period of time when, and it, it, it lasted three years, I had to be in bed at eight o'clock. And I would go off to sleep and I would travel. And I would wake up at 11 o'clock and do housework because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mother, I'm a housewife, you know, I'm a, I've got a job, I've got, so I'd, I'd get up at 11 o'clock and I would do my housework and get to bed back at one o'clock. But for three years, I had to be in bed at eight o'clock so they could give me these downloads. And it's in the downloads that I was told where I had been taken and what it is. The Akashic record is an energetic record, if you can imagine that. And it carries everything that has happened in the world from its beginning. It carries everything that has happened in each and every one of our lives, the experiences we've had, the things we've seen, the things we've done, the things we've denied. And it's, it's not necessarily a judgmental record. It's just a record of life. You can go to the Akashic record and you can learn about the, 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 the age of a tree and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can go to the Akashic records and you can learn about, I learned about the many lifetimes that I lived and what it is that they were sending me back to clean up. 
You got to go clean up. You got to clean up a lot of this fear, Norma. You're walking with a lot of fear. You cannot, you cannot become your sp spiritually whole when you're carrying this amount of fear. See what I'm saying? And, um, but it's an energetic record and it carries everything that has to do with the history of earth, the history of human beings, who we are, those plans that we made, the, play, the ways in which we sometimes we manifested some of the plans, sometimes we don't, but it's not judgmental. It's not at all judgmental. But, but what the Akashic Records was and, and why I was taken there was given to me in downloads. Like I'd wake up in the morning and uh, I'd get to my journal. And um, as a matter of fact, at the time I did not have a computer. And then I started talking to, to a friend about, I wake up in the morning and I have these dreams and, and I'm trying to capture it all. And, and he and his wife, we worked together and he and his wife gave me my first computer so that I can record all of the stuff that was being downloaded to me during the day. So that's where I learned what the cash was, record was. Awesome, okay, so got a ton, of, a ton of questions. What, did somebody? Yeah, we have a question from David Martin. Yeah, I'm writing them all down. Oh, okay, you're receiving them, okay. So. I'm receiving them and trying to uh, write them down as fast as I can. But you know what, uh, since I don't know which one is his and he was the first, do you want to uh, just ask it, Loretta? Do you want to ask Norma? Yes, Norma, thank you so much for sharing your phenomenal story. Uh, David's question is, he wants to know what you think about organized religion since your, your NDE. Thank you very much for that question. I'm glad. I expect I was hoping that someone would ask that question. When I had my near death experience, I was a Christian. 56 years later, I'm still a Christian. I am a spiritualized Christian. Because you see, I had a husband and wife. He was in his 90s, she was 87. Walk me through that Bible and help me to understand and interpret with highly uh, advanced senses. You see what I'm saying? Like, for example, this is just an example. If there's anybody here, and I hope it wouldn't be, be uh, observed as preaching. But if there's anybody here who has studied the Bible or grew up in the Christian religion, I'm sure you have heard or you've heard it said, even from the pulpit, that Peter, um, betrayed Christ. Peter denied Christ. And therefore, no such thing. No such thing. What I saw at the record was Christ came off of a mountaintop after 40 days of fasting and started his work. And he saw Peter and his father. And he said to Peter, follow me. And you know, it's kind of, kind of interesting, um, it's kind of interesting, Sean, you made a statement to me. And when you made that statement, you don't understand how deep and the depth that it carried, something we were talking about. And you say, oh, you have that authority in your voice. Peter heard, felt, and experienced the authority in Christ's voice. And even though he had a mother, a father, a wife, and a family to support. And in those days, if a, man, if a man walked away from his family, his family would starve to death. He heard, he felt, and he experienced the authority. And with that authority, he dropped everything and he followed Christ. Now, the night before Christ died, night he was about to be betrayed, he said to Peter, before the cock crow, you well, deny me three times. That was an authoritative statement, not even a request, a statement. And in the same way that Peter dropped everything and followed Christ, he dropped everything even though he couldn't understand and he betrayed Christ. It wasn't a betrayal. So it's, it's, 
You see, what I saw at the Akashic Record, and this applies to me, I can't say it applies to anybody else, is that when I put this lifetime together, I made a determination that the cup and the cross will be the symbols under which I will live. And having done that, I know that until I go, that's, those are the symbols that would control my life. Now, if I design another lifetime, I may choose some other symbology. Does that make sense, Sean? Yes. Thank you. Let's discuss integration. And how many years did it take you until you came out of the closet? And talk about the shamans from around the world that have helped you integrate and somebody so i'm combining all the questions several questions <laughs> and also do you still have downloads today uh well, these days i don't need downloads because i can travel i can travel and i travel and go visit and well you go to the okashic records daily right no not really because to you me you were there this morning weren't you <laughs> <laughs> Because you call me up four in the morning to tell me about it. <laughs> I wouldn't say that I was, the record was being revealed to me. You see what I'm saying? The record was revealed to me. But um, it took eight spiritual teachers. Because you see, when I came back, my biggest question was, who am I? Who is this woman? How do I know these things? Where did it come from? It, 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 it wasn't a part of the education that I had been given in colleges. You see what I'm saying? Um, and I would really encourage anybody on this show who's got questions to pick up a copy of Awakening because a lot of those questions will get answered in that book. That's that little book that I've just published. It took eight spiritual teachers. And the interesting thing is I didn't go out looking for them. See, when I was a child, I used to ask all these questions. And my father would say, my father was a Mason. And Masons are not allowed to share their information. So my father would say, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And that would anger me because my father was a teacher. And I would really get angry because you're a teacher. What do you mean when the teacher appeared? Well, the teacher appeared in the size of a little tiny 90-something-year-old man who really, really, <laughs> he could not read or write, but he had the whole of the Bible and the sacred books transferred into his heart. And it took three years. He walked with me for three years on the Old Testament, and then he turned me over to his wife, and then she worked on the New Testament. The first two um, teachers were Episcopal priests, but there were Episcopal priests like myself who had a whole lot of questions. And the very first one I got kind of turned on to because um, when we were in England, you know, that's leading religion and so on, we attended this Episcopal church and this pastor really had a belief in angels and he wanted to see angels. Well, at that time I could see angels. And one day it was lunchtime and he was in the sanctuary praying. And um, for some reason he got up and he lit, he lit a candle. And then he lit the candle, the angel came. Well, as a matter of fact, he lit three candles. When he lit the first candle, an angel came. And when he lit the second, when he hit the third one, an archangel came in. And up until then, I had never seen an archangel. So when, I, when you see an archangel, it blows your mind. It really does. And so I, I gasped, you see. And he turned around, he looked at me, he looked at my face and he says, my child, what are you seeing? Describe to me what you're seeing. And then I discovered that he had a longing to be able to see angels. And that started a, a very deep walk. I began to volunteer time at the church. And um, he was the first person to have said to me that, you know, you need to be ordained because the work that you came to do you cannot do it without um, ordination. You have to take vows. But he was the first one to really um, explain to me divinity, sacredness. 
and the levels that they are. We live in a world we think that you know everybody's thrown in as a Christian, everybody's thrown into this same melting pot, and you believe the same thing, and that's how it works. He 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 helped me to understand that there are many levels, and it made sense because of the 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 downloads that they had given to me. You see, had indicated that so. He became like one of my very first teachers. His wife was a, a very, very prominent gardener. She had a beautiful English garden. And she really introduced me to the joys of a garden and joys of nature. So this is why I, I consider that they were spiritual teachers to me. Because up until then, although I grew up in a tropical country, I did not, I was not looking through the eyes, you know, of, 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 of spirituality. So he and his wife became the first, the first spiritual teachers. And all together there were eight. And they found me rather than me finding them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It took a lot of work for me to find out who am I? And if you ask me the question, who am I? I will tell you very quickly, I was born in Guyana, South America. But I'm not a Guyanese. I was born under the British flag because you were a colony at the time. But I'm not British. Lived in Britain for 12 years, not British. I live in America, but I'm not American. I'm a child of God living under the directive of the kingdom. A child of the kingdom of God. That's how I see myself. Beautiful. So, how long did it take you to come out of the closet to tell your story? 15 because years. It... Fifteen years. I didn't speak about it for fifteen years because nobody. I didn't even have a name for what had happened to me, and nobody would have believed me in those days. They really would have put me in a mental institution. So for 15 years, I did not speak about it at all, but I, I kept these journals, you see. And then when my mother was dying, you know, I think in Ions, you all talking about shared experiences. My mother was dying and I was very much sharing the whole, the whole journey every step of the way. And, um, when she was, when she was dying, I realized that there was some fear there. And so one night, late at night, I'm sitting with her and I dim the lights and I begin to speak. And at some point she's really quiet and I, I stopped and I say, is this bothering you? And she says, no, 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 continue, continue. And that was the very first time I shared my near-death experience. And sharing my near-death experience removed the fear from my mother. And the day, the day before she died, she was dying of cancer. And the day before she, she died, and I had wanted her to die at home. Uh, the day before she died, uh, I had this beautiful piece of music by a South American artist, jazz artist. And she asked my brother to put the piece of music on. And when he came back, she said to me, may I have the privilege of this dance? My mother got up. This is a woman who had to be helped out of bed, couldn't make it to the, to the bathroom on her own. And she got up and she danced with my brother. They waltzed and I moved all the furniture out of the way so that they could dance. And she danced and she was so happy and joyful. And the next, next day she died at 12 o'clock. But she died without any fear. And so I kind of observed that and thought, well, you know, maybe this is something that I need to do for others. But it took another five years before I um, ventured out and talked about it. Uh, when did you discover your purpose? When did you realize after all of this that, that you came back for some big important work to do? Well, I came back and I knew, I remembered everything and I still have it in my mind very, very, very real. But I could, I knew that they had told me what my purpose was, but I couldn't remember it. Try as I might, I could not remember what my purpose was. I was constantly 
um, trying to find out what is my purpose, what is my purpose, what is my purpose. And then I got in touch with my main guide and I started working with my main guide. But then I would ask the question and I wouldn't get an answer. And then one day I'm in the United States of America now, this is so many years later, and I'm driving and a voice in my head said, find a spot and park for a moment. So having been taught to be, to be obedient, I found a spot and I parked the car and I turned off the engine and I said, now what? And the voice in my head said, prison. He said, prison? What do you mean by prison? Up until then, I didn't know anybody in prison. I did not even know that there was there was barbed wire around the, the, the fences in prison. I knew nothing about prison. I said, prison? And then the next word I heard was males. And now I really get kind of like anxious, you know. I said, what are you trying to tell me? I have to go in a prison? Is there somebody I have to go into a prison to see or to talk to or to talk to me? What is this? I got so frantic that I drove around and drove out a half a tank of gas, screaming at my guides and at God, if you're trying to get me into prison, I can't do that because I'm afraid of guns and I'm afraid of handcuffs. I was mortally afraid of handcuffs. Ran out of gas and had to be rescued. So then I went to my pastor and um, I explained that I've got this sense that my purpose has something to do with prisons and I, and I can't do that. And I ranted and I raved for about three quarters of an hour. And she says, are you finished? And I said, yes. And she says, well, it seems to me like God is asking you to show up. And maybe if you stop ranting and raving and just show up, he might well show you what it is he wants you to do. And um, that started. And again, I would encourage anybody who wants to to know how that happened because I was still very resistant. And um, I ended up going into prisons as a volunteer, uh, working in a program that um, was a pilot program that eventually created CISOSO. CISOSO is a federal agency and it took 135 men and they carried a pilot for 18 months and the results of the pilot is what started CISOSA. CISOSA is the agency that is responsible for training prisoners when they're about to re-enter the community and providing them with the skills, et cetera, and the right attitude to be able to stay uh, out of prisons. So I started off as a, as a volunteer. And from that, um, Spirit gave me Reprogram Your Life. It's a very um, transformative process. And it was given to me uh, as a download. And then I had to get on a computer and type it all up. And um, once I had typed it up, I sent it to someone they call the czar in Washington, D.C., because he had dedicated his whole life to um, helping pris rid prisoners of substance abuse. And I typed it up and I sent it to him. And I said, well, what do you think of this? And he called me back and I didn't think he would even answer, you know, the question. He called me back. He said, I, I've devoted it my entire life to finding an answer for um, drug addiction, but you just took it to the next level. And I became... Um, a contractor in federal government, very first contractor. They had a hard time writing the description, <laughs> uh, taking spiritual principles, and I mean spiritual principles, and um, placing it into clinical practice. And uh, hundreds, hundreds of men, I, 27 years, you can imagine, carried classes of 35 clients at a time. Hundreds of men and women. So we have some people wanting to know more about uh, your experiences. And uh, so one of them is so many ND ears um, remember that where they were, but they have trouble getting back to that place. And they're, you know, here in a body, 
and they desperately want to be in that place. Um, is there ways that you reconnect with that love and, you know, uh, unforgiveness and all of that? Is there a way that you can connect with it now? And are you still connecting it with it now? I'm going to add a few things. And do you leave your body regularly? Do you still have these out-of-body kind of experiences? Mm -hmm. That's what's yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, first of all, a lot of people write to me and ask, how can I, you know, achieve these things you're talking about? Discipline. There are seven laws that govern the universe that does not change for anybody. Okay, who you are. And until you can align or halfway align yourself to those laws, what did that old man and his wife taught me? He never really answered a question. When I said to him, who am I? He says, well, that's a question for you to ask my wife because you're a woman and she's a woman. And they came to my house and they dismantled my house, literally took everything off the walls, as a matter of fact, when they got to the, 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 the room we use as an office, where you had all the accolades on the wall, they took them all down, put them on the floor. And when they had finished doing every room, the wife said, now let's walk through your house. And each room we entered, she pointed her hands to the, you know, all the, 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 the paintings from the wall and all the, the pictures and the, you know, all the accolades you've created because we traveled a little bit in the world. And as we entered each room, she entered with the same preface. This is not who you are. This is the stuff you have accumulated. This is what this, the stuff, the, the accolades and the degree she put on the floor. She says, this is what the world say you are. Without integrity, you are nothing. And so the journey began. So the journey began. Who are you? You're going to have to go inside of you. You're going to have to think about who you are, what you've done, where you're going, what, what. You're going to have to change the whole nature of what it is that you want to accomplish in life. Because if you're seeking truth, that has to be the number one goal of your life. It wasn't easy. My ex-husband and I had, to have a ma had amassed wealth. Um, and we lived very comfortably. And there was a point when my main guide said, Honey, you're going to go through testing, testing, one, two, three. And you won't hear from us until the testing has produced answers to our questions. Are you living what it is you are saying? We lost everything, Sean. Every last penny. Do you hear me? Every last penny. And as my oldest son said to me, when we arrived in the United States, he said, my mother, we had money in Guyana. We come to the richest country in the world and we're poor. We don't have a cent. So I say to people, you have to really, first of all, go study the law of intention. Yeah, can what you briefly, mention? everybody's asking, what are the seven laws? Or go up on the internet. Just go up on the internet and type in seven laws of the universe. It'll come right back to you. There are many people who have written on it. There are seven laws that govern the universe, and, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't change. And the seven laws can be found in the Bible. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know how hard that is? Because most of us don't love ourselves. So how in the world are we ever going to love somebody more than we love ourselves? So you got you to gotta work on that. You got to work on integrity. The secrets of the universe and the secrets that lie inside of you are not going to be released unto us until we demonstrate that we can walk with some dignity. We know the meaning of integrity. We treat others as we treat ourselves. And that was a long, long, hard journey for me. When I first entered prison and... Um, that first, that first group of men, that pilot group of men, they were hardcore, hardcore criminals. And um, I, I said to Almighty God, I said, how, how can I love you? You're asking me to love everybody, but I know what these people have done. 
And again, you know, ask and it shall be given unto you. And I'm driving one day in Maryland and I come up to the red light and I stop. And the car in the right lane, I have my windows down, it must have been summer. The car in the right lane was, uh, had the back, you know, the back of the car, thrown back. And he was playing a piece of Bob Marley's music. And this line came out of Bob Marley's mouth. The biggest man you ever did see was once a baby. The lights changed and he moved off. And I held on to that piece. So that when I looked at them, I didn't see criminals. I saw babies. When I look at people today, I don't see who they are or what they did and where they come from and all that. What I see are babies who came into the world as pieces of divinity. And it's when, while they are here, stuff happens. They get involved in whatever, whatever, whatever. But they are all, they came in as babies. And guess what? When you leave, you drop all that stuff behind you. And you are the ray of light that you came in. Does that answer your question? So first I had to go through discipline. That, that uh, couple taught me how to fast. Taught me how to fast. And they are dead and gone. And I don't think there is a day that I don't speak of them or glorify their name. And every year during the time of Lent, during the time of Ramadan for Muslims, my husband and I fast for 40 days because it was taught to me. It says you cannot, there's a piece of scripture in the Bible that says you cannot put new wine into old skins. So there has to be a period in every year where you stop and you clean out the skins. Flush, 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 flush that body. Because we store things at the conscious level, we store the things at subconscious level, and then we have a superconscious level where we're very good at shoving everything down there in the hope that it will never rise. But it's in the way. Am I making sense? Yeah, and you're actually touching on something that's really important that we have talked about that when we have these NDEs, we realize we're not a body. And, but then when we come back into the body, many end ears forget they're in a body and are always leaving their body and not being grounded and so forth. And so you've mentioned a few things that you do, um, you know, the, the vegetarianism and the fasting and, but, but can you talk about the importance of that these uh, spiritual awakening NDEs, that they're the beginning, not the end? And that and, and about what the work we still have to do here. Oh yes. Oh, yes. Too many NDEs come back. And, and, and believe me, I mean, I hope you can feel me. I'm not judging. I'm just making a statement. When we open our eyes and we we, we got psychic abilities. We didn't ask for it, but it's there. See what I'm saying? And too many come back and say, Oh, this is a wonderful way to start a business. So we get into entrepreneurship rather than getting in to the real depth of what this means. Because, you know, until a certain amount, and, 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 and a spirit has given me the, the, the percentage, but then they're not allowing me to reveal it to the world, until a certain percentage of humanity gets to the place of awakening, then and only then we can really dream of peace on earth, goodwill to men. You remember John Lennon? Imagine there's no heaven, no hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living life in peace. And the ears are sent back with the awakening, wide awake with information and knowledge that they have to grow and develop and they have to take this physical body and let it become the sanctuary it's intended to be. That old man taught me, he says, know you not that your body is a temple of the living God. 
He said, if I give you a cow, would you kill it and bring the meat and the blood inside of this little church? And I said, absolutely not. So why are you putting this in your body? That was 48 years ago. I'm still a vegetarian. So there is, we have to really seriously, first of all, engage the power of intention. By engaging the power of intention, what I mean by that is being intentional about wanting to find truth, not wanting to find something that is going to benefit me, but wanting to find truth. And then when you're intentional about that, you have to be intentional about allowing spirit to change your life. Because some of the places where we have to be changed, we don't have the guts to take ourselves there. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So it takes discipline. It takes really understanding that wherever our thoughts are, those are the pictures we're building up for our life. Does that make sense? So if I've got my thoughts all the time on negative, I can't really be surprised if negativity is following me around because the universe is going, well, I don't understand why, but he or she seems to need this negative experience. And they'll give you what you think you need. So we are building inside of this temple. We are building who we are either leaning towards divinity and sacredness or leaning towards negativity. Am I making sense? So I say, first of all, it requires discipline. Thank you. Okay, so let's touch on uh, spiritual pra uh, practical spirituality. And a little bit more on, because you are interested in the Bible, you have found truth in there. A lot of NDers don't. Um, so explain practical spirituality for you and how that equates with also several traditional Christian beliefs. And Ooh. do that first, and then, and then I've got some Christian questions. <laughs> you, I should have known. I should have known. You it's gotta, not an easy gotta, ride here. You, you gotta list it. You gotta list it. Practical spirituality for me. And again, you have to understand that what I'm saying here is about what I've experienced and what I've lived. When I had an air death experience, I was 26 years of age. I was married and I was very much in the stream of having children, being a working mother, going to school. I did not have two hours to sit down and meditate. Uh, that just wasn't there. You see what I'm saying? So I think for me, when I say practical spirituality, I am saying it's about you want to know more about who you are spiritually. You want to get in touch with the divinity that has created this whole world. I don't care what you call it. Then you've got to go inward, not look outward. I have read very few spiritual books, very few. You have to turn inside and you have to turn inside and ask questions. And when you ask questions, you will get the answers either in a dream or you'll be taken to a situation that will teach you the answers. Because you see, we read a lot of books. But what we don't understand is after we've read the book, we need to close the book, put it away, and now live what we just read. But we don't do that. We just want to read the next book, don't we? So we're filling ourselves with information and not really experiences that will take us from believing to knowing. And that's the goal. But you believe it. And then you come to know it. And then according to my granddaughter, then grandma, you know, know it. So it takes the discipline of saying, let me put aside, because I've studied seven different religions. I had to, you know, because of my education. 
And the one that really stood out for me was, was Buddhism. I even went to Japan. It stood out for me. But because of what I saw at the record, the record tells me that I had all these religions to choose from before I was born. And I chose, see, I didn't choose the religion. I chose the cross and the cup. And that that is what will govern my life until I leave. There's, there's nothing wrong with reading about or even, you know, participating. But I have to understand that I made a decision before I was born while I was still in spirit. Uh, the symbols that will govern my spiritual world. So I say practical spirituality for me was putting aside the Bible for a while and really getting into quiet meditation, going into myself and asking those questions, what next? I think I gave you um, one of the, I, I don't have too many rituals, but one of the rituals that was given to me was you take a glass, a brand new glass of and you wash it and you make it dry it all out and you fill it with water, holding it in your left hand. And then you, you put that glass of water somewhere and you leave it for a while. And when you come back, as brothers I call them would tell me, if you come back 24 hours later and that glass doesn't have a single bubble in it, you are walking without guidance. Because when you put that glass there, Bubbles will come into the glass and you can count how many guides, guards, teachers, and way showers are walking with you. So that's just a way of checking, 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 one, two, three. And sometimes you may have five bubbles in the glass. Sometimes the glass is full. Sometimes they're all sitting on the bottom of the glass. Sometimes they form a circle around the top of the glass. But that's my way of checking that I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> and I'm but also, if you don't have any bubbles, it doesn't mean you don't have any guides. They're not around you. Right, or you're just or not you listening. May be, you may be doing things that has allowed them to step back because they do that every now and again. I just wanted to clarify that for everyone yeah, in case you, people you know, go try it and they're like, there are no bubbles. That means they have no guides. We don't want people to- No, no, the guides <laughs> are there, but you, whatever it is you're doing, it's like, you know, I'm going to leave you for a while there because, you know, you, you, you need you, to suffer a little more. <laughs> you're running on a, no, you're running an experiment. So I'm going to leave you there with your experiment. And you do so, have another practical tip that was really nice. Uh, you know, for when you get negative thoughts, just the big stop sign, you know. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You stop, you close your eyes, and you, you wait long enough and you would see a hand holding a stop sign. And it reminds you, you got to stop your processing and your thinking because your guides are getting ready to work in transformate, doing transformative work. And you got to stop because you see, when we're processing, we're processing from the world's values. We're not processing from spiritual values. And so practical spirituality for me is put aside the books on Buddhism, put aside whatever, whatever it is that you're reading or you're entertaining yourself with and go inside, even if it's for 15 minutes a day. Listen to your dreams, chart your dreams. When you wake up in the morning, you write down what you feel, even if it doesn't make sense. Um, and begin to listen on the inside. Listen to the kind of music that you, you find yourself engaged in, you're listening to. Listen to those lyrics, because I find that, that music, the lyrics from music, very often is guiding us in the direction where we should go. So for me, practical spirituality is spirituality that I can do all together in maybe 30 minutes in one day. And that 30 minutes may be divided into two 15 and 50 minute sessions. You see what I'm saying? A practical spirituality for me is park the car four or six blocks away and walk. Because while you're walking, you're engaging in nature. See what I'm saying? Because you don't maybe don't have time. If you like me, if you have children, you don't have time to go walking for an hour or two hours. It, there became a time in my life when I could do that. That was a luxury. But when I couldn't do that, I parked the car and 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 walked the four or six blocks. You see, 
Every now and again, allow your feet, your bare feet to touch the soil because there's a phenomenal amount of energy coming up in the soil all of the time. And leather keeps us from absorbing it all. So every now and again, you have to kick the shoes off and stand there and, and let the energy of the earth penetrate and move through your body. It comes through the feet and it comes all the way out the top of the crown of the head. So that is practical spirituality for me. You find practical ways to be able to live this spiritual life. You create a rhythmic pattern. You wake up at the same time every morning and you do the same simple little things. Like, you know, um, I will put, since I've come back, music means a lot to me because I can see and I can feel the energy that it emits. And so I'm, I'm a big music fan. And um, when I work with people in transformation, I use music. First thing I do is I will search and find a piece of music that carries the pattern that is similar to the pattern that you came in with. And then once I've found that, then I can now look at where you diverted. See what I'm saying? And it may be that piece of drumming and that piece of music. It may be the piano. It may be the horn. Um, but but I do a lot of work with 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 rhythm and music. So it is practical spirituality is finding your path. There's nothing wrong with reading about all these other paths, but you have got to find your path, and you find your path by spending time going inside, quiet time with yourself. If you're gonna walk, you don't walk with the headphones. As much as I love music, I don't walk with it. You're walking so that you can listen to your spirit. You can get into your rhythm. And even if it's only 15 minutes that you can do that a day, that's fine. And that's really good advice because a lot of us, our guides are always speaking to us. But if we're listening to other stuff and thinking about other stuff, we're not hearing what they're saying. So that's really good advice to leave the headphones at home. Um, leave the headphones at home. And the other piece of advice that I would give is um, for those of you who are praying, praying people, begin to listen to your prayers. Brother made me not only listen to me, when I pray, he made me write it down. And then he would say, we're not going to review it for a month. But every day you have to write down what you prayed for. And then when I would present him with this book and I would read to him, and, Boy, he would throw his head back and he would laugh so hard. He says, so you got the nerve to go to the creator of the universe and tell him what to do? <laughs> so how else, uh, when you're teaching like your students and stuff, because you do mentoring in classes, mm -hmm. um, how else do you help people trust their connection to spirits? Um, what, are, what are some other ways? First, they have all, they're going to find who they are. Before you can go to trusting your connection, you got to find out who are you. And I have a beautiful poem called Birthright that I, um, I work with people. It's my birthright to be at peace, to know myself, to wonder at the beauty of nature. This is your birthright. So before you go trying to find all these phenomenal things about yourself, you need to find out who you are and what's your birthright. And then once you found out those two, now you've got the basic, basic pattern upon which you can go about. Because it's fine to read, but if you don't know who you are, every single book will pull you in this direction and that direction and the other direction. But when you have found who you are and you're reading a book, whatever that piece of information in that book is that relates to your being will jump out at you. Can you see it? So you're not reading just, to, just for the pleasure of reading it. You're reading so that your spirit can let you know where the connection is. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes. Do, do you want to mention what your birthright is? Love. 
It's all of our boat ride. That's amazing thing. After all this seeking and searching, when I came out with it, oh my God, that old man danced like, he just literally danced through his head. He said, oh my God, you got it. You got it. Now he could easily have told me that. It took over a year before I came to that conclusion. But when I came to the conclusion, he danced. I said, well, why didn't you tell me? He says, oh, I would have told you and you would have listened and go, that's nice and get on with your business. <laughs> you had to figure it out for yourself. That's our birthright, Lord. Okay, so here's a Christian question. Uh, so since you're still a Christian, do you still believe, assuming that you did, because you might not have believed this, but that we all have to accept Jesus Christ and, and his death to be saved? I didn't even believe that when I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> can, you see can, I... my mother, can you see why my mother had a hard time with me? <laughs> I didn't believe that when I was nine. So when I came back from a near death experience, there was no hope in there no hope in hell that I was gonna believe that. You see, because oh, that's you, right. Your mom told you not to talk to the preachers. Oh, yeah. You'd go to church, don't, be don't, quiet, don't, leave them alone. Don't, don't touch him, she said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh I guess you've answered the rest of it, but we'll, I'll just go ahead and we'll make it clear. So uh, did you say that you no longer believe in hell? There is no hell. And people who tell you they went to hell, let me tell you what they did. You see, when you go through that tunnel, the tunnel is kind of like directly to guide you off of the earth's atmosphere, etc., into the light. All that happened is they didn't go through the tunnel. They went into the depths of earth. That's what they experienced. Think about it. God says he loves us unconditionally. Did he not? That even while we were sinners, okay, he gave the sacrifice. So you see, I used to ask the question, I, I was a very troublesome child when it came to language. My father was an English teacher. I said, well, what's the meaning of unconditional? And then my father would give me the meaning of unconditional. And I said, well, God loves us unconditionally. You're my father. Could you burn me up in hell? And there's no answer for that. And we, you didn't Oh, I did go finish and then there's something else I want to ask you about that. Yeah, but, but, but I mean, we, 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 you see, we're told in religion, not just Christian religion, all religion, you have to believe. First you believe, then you receive, and then you come into knowing. It's when you're knowing that you can manifest all these things. When you know that you are divinity, you are a piece of light, you are a spark of light, you are divinity, and you have spent some time clearing the crop from over the light. You understand what I'm saying? So no, even when I was nine, I didn't believe that. And so when you had like a life review or something similar, you, were you judged? Did you feel any judgment? Like no, the Bible says? I told you I was laughing my head off. It just seems stupid. <laughs> I just need to confirm. <laughs> I was just laughing my head off. Now, how could I have lived for 26 years and not know that I had a plan? Okay, so what is the importance, these are questions that I'm reading, of uh, believing in uh, Yeshua ben Joseph, aka Jesus Christ? Is that important? Do you believe in that, him? What, what, how does he fit into your- These are people who carried a little bit more light than I'm carrying. And whether we're talking about Muhammad, whether we're talking about the Buddhist priest, or the Buddhist priest could teach us some things, I'm here to tell you. Whether we're talking about the Jewish rabbi, these are people, now we know some of them follow the divine pattern and some of them follow their own pattern. But I say, as long as you make that commitment to yourself, that I am seeking truth, truth will present itself to you. 
You see what I'm saying? But you have to make that commitment. Not I am searching to see what I could find so I could take a piece from here and a piece from there. I am seeking truth. And once you establish that inside yourself and you give that to the universe, the universe is going to give you to. These are people who carry large levels of light in their life. And so we have something to learn from them. But I don't think that we only have to learn from Jesus Christ. These are people who carry a lot of light. And many people don't see Jesus. That's right. Or God. Because I watched lifetimes where I didn't, I wasn't a Christian. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, very we important. We live everything in sequence. We, by the time we come to not having to reincarnate on earth, we are going to have lived all of the religions. Because there's something that we have to get from each other. So people want to know, do you have to have an NDE to experience what you've experienced and uh, to get the, the knowledge that you've experienced? Do you think they have to have had an NDE? No, you don't have to. And that's one of the things that I'm teaching, you see. You don't have to have an NDE. But if you come to me, I'm going to tell you, you better, you know, put on your seatbelt because... It's going to be wrong because things that are important to you may have to be wrestled away from you. Thoughts and ideals that you're hoping, holding will have to be wrestled away. You see what I'm saying? To put you in alignment. Put you into alignment. The truth is there for anybody who is willing to do I don't want to say the work, because when I say the work, people think it, it's just hard work. But if you are willing to embrace change, because you see, 90% of the time, we want some things to be different, but we don't want to embrace change. If you are open to embracing change, then you, you are a candidate to be taken to the light. And the light is inside of you, not out there. It's in here. It's in here. Um, so you talked about your one son, but how, how did your experiences affect your grandchildren? Well, your children first and then your grandchildren, because oh both of your sons have kind of different perceptions of, of Oh life. my God. My father used to say to me, do not, do not run after, um, money or fame. Because when you die, it's in about how famous you were. He would say, when you die, it's about the quality of human beings you've left behind. That's your legacy. And oh God, I'm living it. I just turned 80. My children got together and gave me an 80th birthday. Actually, I didn't particularly want it. Because <laughs> I do like, like the gentleman who, who prayed us in. Uh, we've had, we had one birthday. And, uh, you know, I'm celebrating that birthday, but I don't have a birthday every year. But, um, oh, my God. And I thank the universe for the adversities that I was put through with those five children. Because I got divorced with five children. And I became a single mother for 20 years. Because I made a commitment. My children came first. And then 20 years later, when the last one got off to college, I remarried. And it's been, oh my goodness, I've got eight grandchildren. Four of them have already finished college. I got one going into college this year. Uh, and and they are, they amaze me. They just, they just really do. They just really do. Because you see, as parents, we're living examples. And um, every now and again, you know, we're not perfect, but every now and again, you got to stop and, 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 and take a look at the, at the journey, you know, and make some adjustments. Um, when I had my first child, I didn't know any better. Corporal punishment, you know, you, you lash out every now and again. When I had my second child, it was like, wait a minute, I'm an adult. There's no reason in the world why as an adult, I should you know, be beating up on it. So the other four, 
were raised without that kind of punishment. Um, I think once I got divorced, and since I was the one who walked away, it was very important for me to maintain family and love and, and all that stuff. So that allowed me to get really close to my children um, and to, we're very, very, very tight-knit family, very tight-knit family. And, and as a result of my own um, spiritual education, I said to each one of my children, by the time you are 33, you have to be married. A man 33 years of age with no responsibility is doomed. <laughs> and they followed suit. All of them are married. And I am very blessed. I'm, I'm extremely blessed. Beautiful. Okay, we'll wrap up with just a few more questions. And if anybody asked a question that I didn't, ask that I missed. Go ahead and stick it in the chat now. But let's talk a little bit about um, current uh, um, events. And so somebody asked, what are your thoughts about the level of fear in the world today? Because staying in a place of love, a state of love, is very challenging. So given what's going on, what do you have to, what are your recommendations or or comments on that? You see, in 2012, the earth shifted from, from a third dimension to, to fifth. We started a shift. And when we started that shift, it's like you're in a boat and the boat is not too sturdy and the storm comes along <laughs> and therefore you're experiencing, you know, you're experiencing the wind and the and the waves and, and so on and so forth. And in 2012, I was told that the gardeners of the earth will be entering the earth to clean up the earth. And I said, what does that mean? And they say, just pay attention. Pay attention and you'll see. COVID, for example, uh, there's a lot of people that need to be moved off the earth. And if you go back in history, you would see there are places in, in, in history where large sets of people, large portions of people have to be moved. If you're not willing to, to give up your fear, because it's kind of like we, we clutch, we're clutched onto this fear, we're holding on to this fear, you know. Um, and we're holding on to the fear because we don't have any really strong beliefs about anything positive. And I have to acknowledge, as I said, I'm still a Christian, mind you, a spiritualized one. But my God, we've built towers of fear in this world, towers of fear. And they have to be dismantled. And if we are not willing to embark on a, on a footprint or a pathway that is going to allow us to release this fear, we're gonna to have to be removed, shaken up, set back. But I have to acknowledge that the Christian faith is one that has built a phenomenal among towers. I call it towers of faith. As you can imagine, you know, pastors aren't too happy with me because I tell it like it is. I ask the question, how could you be a Christian involved in a church for 40, 45 years, and when it's time for you to die, you're shaking with fear. Something is wrong. Terribly wrong. Because throughout that 45 year journey, you should have learned everything about love. Beautiful. What so would you... the gardeners of the earth are working and they're cleaning up, they're cleaning up. And you have to understand, we live many, many, many lifetimes. There is no death. As a matter of fact, maybe to help people understand, we should take the words death. We should take the words birth and death completely out of our vocabulary. There is arriving and leaving. That's really what it is. You arrive so you can learn the lesson. Once you got the lesson, you have to leave. Go do a review of what you have accomplished or not accomplished. 
write another plan and come back. So there's more about arriving and leaving than there is about birth and dying. There is no death. I love what you said about the gardeners of the world, because we, we got to see that here in Hawaii during COVID without all the tourists. And it was amazing how everything was able to replenish uh, and so forth. The final question, and by, and by the way, so everybody, if you go to Hawaiian Islands, there's a replay of the video, which we'll have a, a YouTube one up later. But if, if your message wasn't answered, go to the replay and answer it there and then, um, um, or ask it there. And then um, Norma can answer, answer it. So what is the big takeaway message that you would like everybody to take home tonight if you have one? Because I know you have so many wonderful messages, but if you can <laughs> sum it up. Life is eternal. Christ was not the only one resurrected. <laughs> Life is eternal. Live every moment of it. Seek to understand the meaning of the word love. Because somehow we have distorted it. We have Oh my God, turn it into something that it, it isn't. Seek the truth. As you get up in the morning, let your prayer be. Guide me. Whether you call it the universe, whether you call it God, whether you call it Allah, it doesn't, Yahweh, it doesn't really matter. But ask of this phenomenal force that has created all of this. Ask that you be shown the truth, that you be given the truth. And you will begin to find that um, you will find truth in some very, very unlikely places. It's very unlikely. I had a young lady who was in prison at the time and she would not participate. She'd come to the program, she'd come to the program and she would sit there, she'd give her name and her number and she wouldn't participate. She was very negative and um, tried to pull her out. And then one day she said to me, she says, well, 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 what is there to be happy about? She says, I've been abused since I was old enough to remember, you know? And um, she says, there's nothing in this world uh, for me to celebrate or what happened, but she would show up and that was it and she wouldn't say anything and about three months passed. And then she came to class one day and handed me a poem on love. And it blew me away, blew me away. Um, and she says, you know, when I get out of here, I am going to take the time to understand the universe. I'm going to take the time to learn about nature. I'm going to take my attention away from what my life has been and try to take it to the she said, because if 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 the trees, if some source out there keeps these trees alive for hundreds of years, um, then surely there must be some positivity there, you know. She says, and, and the waves and the ocean and the water and the ocean, because you know, I would teach. Water is to spirit what oxygen is to humans. And if you take all the water out of the world, we couldn't survive because our spirits and our guides and our guardians and our angels would not be able to reach us. And so while I thought she wasn't listening at all, she was. Um, so the takeaway for me is to recognize, first of all, that life is eternal. So when you understand that, you give up this fear of dying. You give up this fight that I have to stay alive. You know, I, 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 there were times there when I stop and wonder, you see, because I'm the only female in my family who has lived to 80. None of the women in my family live past 60. And so I didn't expect to live past 60. And I was quite happy with that because I'd been to the other side and I see what it was like. Here I am, 80, and now you're sitting there telling me that I still have work to do. No, come on, have some sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So live, live your life, live your life and, and, and push the dogma aside, push the, the religion aside and tell yourself you are seeking the truth and nothing but the truth. And those books that contain elements of the truth will find its way into your library. You will run into people who will drop you little ideas that you never thought about. Once you make a commitment uh, that you want to know the truth and that when you find out the truth, you will attempt to halfway live it. We've only got a halfway live it, you know. If we live it halfway, the universe is going to provide the other half. And from that will come the joy. You see, that little old lady back in Guyana used to say to me, there is joy unspeakable and full of glory. And if you stop trying to make your own joy, <laughs> you might just stumble on that joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. And I think I have found this in my own. And that was really important what you just said. We just have to have the willingness and take the first step. God and the universe will help us yeah, with the rest. To take the answer. And it doesn't even matter whether you call him God or you call him. You have to acknowledge that something created all this. Something even else. It was a us. big bang. There had to be some kind of energy to have forced the big bang to happen. You see? So don't get all hung up about whether you call him God or you believe in God or you. Something created all this. And, and when you question, ask yourself the question I used to ask. I said, but wait a minute. There are no doctors that take care of birds. Yet I never walk down the street and find hundreds of birds dead. Who takes care of them? Who takes care of that ocean to ensure that the water levels stay the way they are? So it, 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 it matters not if you're seeking truth, you'll find it. And sometimes we have to step away a little bit from, from that which we have come to believe so that we can find that which is real. Does that make sense? That's actually one of the gifts of Bandy. A lot of times is our false beliefs are wiped away. Mm -hmm. And, and that is one way to not have an NDE, to just clear away those false beliefs that's right. that we have of ourselves. And, and that's lives. work. You see, that's work. And um, usually, even when we are willing to work, we have been conditioned to believe we're going to work so we could get paid and we can get rich, you see. So when you try to tell people you have to do work so that you can build your spiritual pattern and push your frequency higher, they don't want to hear that. But live, live and know that you're, um, Sean, if I could somehow, and maybe I'll get an artist, my husband is an artist, to, to create a piece of art so that I can show what I have seen when I go to the other side. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of spirit waiting in line to get the opportunity to come spend some time on Mother Earth. Thousands of souls. I am so glad you said that because yes, if you and I are one of them, we need to live it to the last. We're moment. very lucky to be in a body. Thousands standing patiently in line waiting. Because this earth is the best school of the cosmos. This is where you're learning. And one of the hardest, too, they say, right? Well, yeah. well hard work. If you want to learn something, you have to put something in it. Yeah. school of life well thank you very much I, people are starting to i think uh straggle off mm -hmm. but this has been such an amazing night and thank you for all the wonderful comments i wanted to read them out but i i, I couldn't because i wanted to answer all the questions but i norma all of your amazing comments that you wrote and uh really an honor this has been a wonderful night and if everybody remembers February 18th, please join us. It'll be Saturday, uh, celebrating uh, Black History Month and a panel of African-American and the ears. We're gonna be honoring the people that have come before that have had these experiences before there was a uh, description and who didn't really have the luxury to tell their stories. 
and um, it's going to be really uh, an amazing night to just honor honor all of that and the different experiences. So I hope you'll join us. We're doing it on a Saturday night, so more people can come. And so, before you go, before you go, Sean, okay. this is just me, and um, you could you could call me up after the after this is over, and you could tell me off, and that's okay. Tell you off. Yes. <laughs> but I want to put out a plea to people to who have listened. If you have learned anything tonight, if you have enjoyed this session, please remember that uh, 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 Ho Ions Hawaiian Style is a nonprofit organization. And in order to be able to bring you these wonderful um, views, and, and, and aspects of life that like everything else, we need to support in a very big way. And I'm one of those who've asked all those um, of my friends that I've invited to listen tonight, whether they would, um, they would provide a donation so that this wonderful, beautiful work that Sean is doing here can be continued and it can reach the lives, you know, Sean, you have no idea of the lives that you are reaching. Very often you may reach a life that is at the end of its tether, you know, and from what they can hear from, from these interviews, et cetera, they are able to stand tall and, and reclaim their lives. And so I'm just asking that, you know, as, as many of us, we, have, we frequent this, this um, site very often and so on. So remember to drop a donation so that we can keep the work going uh, right across, right across the not just the nation, but you've got people even from overseas that are participating here. So let's um, let's give so that we may receive. You know, as we give, that's one of the things I taught my children. You, know? you have to give so that you can receive, because we our hands become the hands of the Almighty. And, you know, when people pray and they say, oh, Lord, help me, I need blah, 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 blah. The universe doesn't have hands to come down and give it. It's our hands that do the giving, you see. And I think this is a wonderful, um, this is a wonderful forum. And I would really like to see it continue and, and grow experientially as you go along. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And if you have any other questions, let Sean know when he will pass them on to me. And I'm hoping to see you guys on the 18th again when I'll be part of that panel. God bless Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night and we'll see you soon. It's been a really nice night. And thank you, Sylvia, for er, that candle. I'm seeing that Sylvia is holding a candle for us all. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, That's wonderful. beautiful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. God okay. Bless you. Bye Have bye. a wonderful night and aloha, everyone. We will see you soon. Bye. Bye.